Okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm Danica Barik. I'm uh, an archaeologist at the University of Cambridge, but I've also, for the last year or so, been working on a project, an uh, independent project, the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology, also in Cambridge, uh, where we've been delivering decolonial tours. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about the practical experience of how we put those together, what it was actually like to deliver them, what we found really worked, and potentially if other people would be interested in doing similar projects, the kind of um, lessons you could take away from this. Um, so just a quick uh, just a quick introduction to this. Obviously, we've already had a whole half day of really, really interesting conversation about this, so I'm not going to go into it too deeply. Um, but there's lots of different ideas about how to decolonize museums. Um, there's... Um, I don't know, I wouldn't really describe it as, as sort of a spectrum, for example, but some of the biggest things that museums can do are, as we already discussed, hire people of color in permanent positions in, and across the board as curators in education and outreach, have them on the board of trustees, um, have us, you know, front of house, um, not, and not just one of us per institution, that would be very helpful. <laughs> um, and also repatriation, returning objects that are um, contested or meaningful or with this demands for their return, um, being much more open to those conversations. But what are the other things that museums can do as well? Um, I'm really interested in museums hiring practices and museums repatriation policies, but I didn't necessarily see how I could have that much impact on them. So I was interested in what else I could do kind of on the ground um, as an activist. Um, and this was something that I found really interesting, the idea of disrupting the norms, um, actually having these very, very honest conversations about where objects come from, um, when objects are connect collected under colonialism or during conflict, um, and when objects have come from, um, from funerary contexts um, and things like that. So uh, just, a quick, just a quick background. Three of us came together to do these tours. Um, my colleagues couldn't be here today because of uh, various reasons, including one of us had our Viva this month. It wasn't me, don't cheer. <laughs> well, you can cheer for <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, The three of us came together previously for another project at the museum, and this ended up being a digital arts installation. And it talked about um, how uh, the, the idea of possession, of taking hold of an object, and it was called Take Hold. Uh, and we really liked that final project, but one of the things that we felt was our earlier, uh, and I'm sure lots of people in this room can relate to this, our earlier very radical ideas had in the end been slightly watered down almost. Um, and another thing that I've noticed is that sometimes I go for exhibitions and I think, wow, these labels are really radical. And then I later on will read a review and realize that actually it's been completely misinterpreted or the um, that honesty has almost been been ignored, and I realized that somehow people are still um, somehow people just don't necessarily get the message. Um, and so we decided that what we wanted to do was this very very direct engagement, bring people to the museum, look them in the eyes, and then tell them <coughs> this object was stolen, and see how that worked out. <laughs> um, so we. Oops. Um, so quick story, we pitched, this, we pitched that to the museum. Um, they were really, really receptive, actually. They were really um, interested in that idea, and they actually gave us seed funding for the start of it as well. So they've been really, we've had a very positive relationship with the museum that we worked with. I don't know how many other people have similar, um, similar experiences of that. Uh, but the process of writing the tour, um, this took uh, probably about three months, maybe, from start to finish. Not every day, obviously. We had lots of other things to do, uh, but essentially we walked around the galleries over and over. I probably looked at every single object on display in the museum now, um, maybe four times in the last 18 months, which is actually a lot. Um, we narrowed our focus down to three broad themes, because what we essentially wanted to do was to break down the mystery of the museum, kind of, and a bit like how you talk about teach people how to interpret museum labels. What does it actually mean when a museum label says unprovenanced, for example? Um, you know, how is that information glossed over and how can you learn the language almost of how, um, of what, what those things actually mean? So we decided we want to talk about collection, how objects are collected. Obviously a lot of that comes down to 
talking about colonialism and conflict and um, the illegal antiquities trade and things like that. We wanted to talk about um, display and curation as well. So what happens to objects when they're within a museum, the kind of decisions that museums make. Um, and then we want to talk about representation as well, which is when you take objects from other cultures and you write labels about other cultures, what is the idea of these cultures that you are giving to the visitors to your museum? Um, then we ruthlessly, ruthlessly cut out every single thing that didn't fit within the theme. We lost so much, uh, so much of our research that we could probably do another three tours um, just using that. But it was really, really necessary because um, one of the things that we, um, one of the best compliments that we got actually from people coming on the tour was that the narrative was very strong. And so that's actually a really, really helpful thing for us to, um, for us to acknowledge. You, it, we can just bombard people with this information, but tell stories in a way that they flowed into each other and then reinforced our earlier points as well. That's just the principles of writing, I'm sure. Most of you already know that. Um, and then we did a lot of test runs as well. We did these, this is just really practical as well. We were really nervous about making sure that it went well on the day. And I think, again, this is probably something that people in the room can sympathize with, especially the other people of color in the room. You know that there isn't really room to make mistakes. Um, that you want to be able to deliver it flawlessly so that um, people can't pick on smaller things um, and they just focus on your message. I mean, it's almost impossible to do that completely, but you can minimize their dis disruption to the message. Um, and then through the year and a, um, through the year or so, we uh, didn't make enormous changes to the tour, actually. We wrote one tour and then um, try to deliver that to as many people as possible. And we did rewrite some sections for clarity, and that's the, those are specifically the ones where people um, managed to avoid the message that we were trying to give them. We cut weaker material, that's material that didn't reinforce the message enough. Uh, and only once we added a section in response to critique. So it's actually kind of a strange project because you almost have to ignore all the critique that you get and just keep uh, keep going, which is, which is a new experience. <laughs> Um, after some debate, we also ended up um, trying to include some examples of positive steps the museum had taken, um, specifically other objects where they'd um, worked respectfully with communities or examples of modern art that they'd commissioned from indigenous artists like George Nunku or Lisa Rehana, um, and tried to point those out to people. And this also felt maybe like a strange thing to do for a critical tour, but we found it really stopped people from getting their backs up completely and from coming to us at the end and saying it seems completely hopeless and we say actually it's not there's lots of things museums can do you can return objects you can source other objects in very ethical ways um there's options and i think people found that um found that a bit more hopeful maybe so finally we launched our tour in october 2018 we were very um lucky in that we were able to take um, we were able to sort of jump on to massive interest on cultural, uh, on off cultural events within Cambridge, and we were able to take advantage of the university's mega structure, infrastructure for things like this. So we went out as part of the Festival of Ideas. Um, they were really, really popular. They booked up within a day. We had people coming on the day as well to see if they had extra, if we had extra tickets and things like that. And that's when we realized there's really legs to this. People want to hear these stories, how can we keep this going? Um, so we have carried on doing them. Our next steps were to kind of build on that momentum. Uh, and this is, this is um, the way of talking about this is essentially about professionalizing it as such, about building it as a brand, which is gross to say, but um, that's, that's, the, that's how to get it out there. Um, some of this will seem very obvious, but all of it was, was really, really important to do because our main um, goal in doing this actually was to be able to get this message to people who are not receptive to it. Um, and so you may have noticed before in this that we've given it a very neutral sounding name. Um, a lot of the descriptions were very neutral and so actually the kind of people who came for our tours for most of the last year also were people who would not have booked a tickets for a decolonial tour. <laughs> <laughs> Um, another thing that we found really helpful was working with local media. We tried to make use of those as much as possible to get the word out. We wanted to reach um, local people in Cambridge. Um, these are actually very specific examples because I think they're only, they only get to a certain 
demographic in the Cambridge population. So um, that's actually not that bad because that's a demographic we wanted to reach. <laughs> um, so finally, until histories in, in numbers, this is some of the practical information that we got. Um, we were actually very successful in managing that, managing to reach the demographic that we wanted. Most of the people who came on our tour, anecdotally, we didn't collect demographic information, but most of them were older white people. Um, so I would say um, 50, 60 plus. And they were the kind of people who are interested in museum events. They keep an eye open for you know, the latest exhibition, things like that, you know, what's the newest um, play playing at the ABC theater, things like that. And so this was kind of a, um, a buzzy cultural event for them. Um, and this is pointer. Yes, and as you can see, um, Twitter was basically worthless. Um, <laughs> <laughs> in, many, in many ways, Twitter was worthless. But Facebook was extremely, extremely helpful. And I think there are studies now that show as well that the demographics on Facebook are skewing older and older as well. So this was the best way, actually, that we had alongside email, which I think mostly refers to the um, bulletin sent, by, sent out by our independent like cultural events ticketing providers. So those reached um, the most people, which is really um, interesting and helpful. So if you're doing something like this, I know Facebook is terrible, but that's how you get the, you get the word out. <sighs> the experience of doing the tours, um, we had a lot of feedback. We, the tour was one hour long. Sometimes we would end up having at least an hour of conversation afterwards. People really, really stayed on. Um, the end of the tours was the, the end of the tour hour was really much more dynamic than we thought it would be, which is good in a way, but it also makes it a really, really fraught experience for us to do. Um, you know, we had people who were very hostile. We had people who were really confronted by the information that we were giving them. Uh, and we had people who, people who love museums and identify themselves as people who love culture and museums. And to have the idea of the museum or the positive of the museum dismantled for them um, over the course of our tour was, was profoundly uncomfortable for a lot of them. Um, so one of the reasons I've included this, um, I don't know if you can make it out actually, but it's a looted uh, Tibetan dorji, uh, which presumably came from the young husband um, expedition <laughs> of Tibet. Um, and it's on this thing with an early 20th century label that's on, that's I think dated to a few years after the invasion. Um, and I don't know if you can make this up, but it describes the object as looted, one of Captain Orr's looted objects. And this is one of the things that we show to people um, to kind of, uh, one of the arguments that we got a lot was that we were imposing modern ideas onto histories where they just weren't relevant. Um, and so we use this to sort of see actually even contemporaneous sources would have considered these objects looted as well. Um, and my favorite bit of feedback to this was a woman who stopped us and said, um, do we even know that the word loot meant the same thing at the time? <laughs> um, which just goes to show you. <laughs> you can't explain everything. <laughs> but, we, but there was a lot of denial. And so this is, I, I'm glad actually that we got this piece of negative written feedback because the worst feedback that we got was verbal. Um, people did not write that down in the museum visitors book and they didn't put it on our Facebook page or email it to us. They said it to us to our faces, um, which was just really good. Um, which leads me to my next point, prepare for emotional labor. If you're a person of color doing this work, if you're a woman of color doing this work, it's really, really hard to do. Do not underestimate that. Um, we figured out a system to help it work for us. We always worked in pairs. We didn't do any of the tours. Um, alone, that was really, really helpful because if you have a group of maybe 15 people who hate what you're saying and want to fight with you for an hour after the tour, it's helpful to know you have a friend there with you who will at least back up your points um, and help you feel you're working safely. We never felt physically threatened, but um, there's other elements to, to creating a safe space. Stand your ground, people will really, really argue with you. Um, one of the things about, as I said, professionalizing it is once we started charging people for tickets, um, there's on, there was almost a sense that um, they paid for this. We didn't want to be rude to them, um, which I don't think we were rude to them, but you absolutely still have to just stand your ground and say, this is true. 
Um, we are highly trained doctoral researchers at the University of Cambridge. We assure you our research is excellent <laughs> and things like that. Um, we also took note of the most common questions. Um, usually people actually had the same kind of questions over and over. So you can prepare an answer for that. You're very confronted maybe the first time. We're very confronted with the loot question the first time. Uh, and after that, the three of us discussed it. And one of us, it wasn't me, I wish, but one of us helpfully pointed out that the word loot is actually Indian in origin. <laughs> That's where we're all from. We know exactly what it means. The meaning is very, very clear. That word is also looted. <laughs> Although it's always factor in some quiet downtime, work safely, activism cannot happen without self-care. It was really, really hard to do, usually after doing one of these, and then an hour of discussion mm -hmm. time, when sometimes the audience would fight with each other, uh, <coughs> we usually just went home and had a nap afterwards. <laughs> Don't plan anything else after doing one of these. Don't schedule too many of them, um, because without knowing how long you might actually need in between, um, because it is really, really exhausting to do, especially if you're doing them on top of everything else that you might be um, doing. Finally, big ethical considerations and questions. So we had a very, very positive with the museum that we worked with, a uh, very, very positive relationship with them. Um, they were really supportive from the start. Like we said, they gave us seed funding uh, to do it. Uh, they actually even booked group tours with us where they paid for their staff to come and hear us talk talk about their museum, which was really um, <laughs> unique, maybe, I think. Uh, but did, did, that really, did that close relationship actually have an impact on our work? Um, I hope not, but it's kind of one of the, um, it's almost like you can't win in this situation. If the museum makes it really hard to do it, then you might not ever be able to get it off the ground. But the museum is very nice to you. So I told them I was coming here to do this talk. And they said, just you know, be completely honest, say whatever you want to say. And then I thought, I feel really bad if I say something terrible about them. <laughs> so that is something that actually really gets in your head. Um, then we focused explicitly on race and racialized misogyny. Um, this was actually something that meant we got a lot of pushback on this in questions occasionally. People would say, you haven't talked at all about class, or people would say, um, on one memorable, actually multiple memorable occasions, actually people said, you haven't talked at all about women. And we have to say, we have talked about women, actually. Um, just not white women. <laughs> um, very strange to have to say, do you remember when we stopped and looked at, yeah, would you remember when we you remember that photograph of Zulu women? We talked about that. Uh, finally, we only included the content, to, content notice once when a group booker asked us um, to include an access statement. Um, otherwise, we didn't. Was that actually ethical to do if you're talking about sexual assault, if you're talking about these violent histories, shouldn't, should you be giving your audience some kind of heads up about the content? Um, this is a I, I don't know the right answer here. We didn't most of the time because, like we said, we wanted to um, get people who would, wouldn't want to hear anything about colonialism or racism in museums. Um, I don't know if that was the best decision. It's, it's kind of what we went with, um, I think, moving in the future, maybe I would include something um, slightly in between, maybe not an extremely graphic one. Uh, and finally, was it actually um, very dishonest for us to pretend it was going to be a fun tour, just about <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think, <laughs> I, I, I mean, it's just something to think about. I think it worked. If that's what you want to do. It was very effective. Um, I don't know if that uh, is false advertising. Um, Finally, did we manage to achieve our goals? I mean, these, which many of you um, can probably tell, are bronzes from Benin. Um, they are still in the museum, so in a lot of ways we did not decolonize the museum. Um, what did we manage to do, though? What are the pros and cons of actually trying to decolonize a museum through um, a critical tour or through audience engagement? Um, it educates people on an individual level. It had a lot of impact. Um, people were really interested. We had people emailing us sort of months after the tour to, to tell us that they were thinking differently about race. That was really meaningful um, and, and just uh, almost really unexpected. So that felt really, uh, felt really interesting. Um, it could help build support for a wider agenda. We had people also sending a lot of feedback to the museum saying, you should change these labels, you should do this. And that felt really, um, that felt really good as well. So now some of the label, labeling is actually being changed. I don't know if that's because of us, but 
Um, I'm going to say it is because you, know, <laughs> you won't know any better. <laughs> and it was really empowering for people of color who came as visitors. They specifically told us how um, the experience felt very unique. Um, they said it felt it felt powerful. They couldn't believe they were standing in a museum and having someone say these things just completely straightforwardly without um, hedging their language, without using euphemistic language, just looking them in the eye and saying, this is a fact. We know that Britain invaded Tibet. That's it. Um, and it was empowering for us as guides too. And you know, that counts for something as well. Um, the cons are that it's unlikely to lead to major institutional change. Um, it's often, I mean, tours like this, especially with us as well, it was carried out by um, temporary, casually employed workers. Um, it also, the way we did at least, it puts the burden on people of color. Um, and I don't think, I mean, I've said debatable. For us, it hasn't had any impact on the museum's repatriation policy. Uh, but I also wanted to point out this, it's partially reliant on us staying outside the system. Uh, if you want to maintain independence, if you want to, um, feel free to criticize the museum. And that's that's maybe one of the biggest problems with it, actually. I think it is possible to be within a system and be very, very critical, but um, I do think having um, this kind of pop-up intervention um, might be easier to do, potentially, if you're not actually part of the institution. Ooh, I'm finished. <laughs> <laughs> this is my, this is my <laughs>